All right, lecture 71, Newton's proof of Kepler's first law, or the 1 over r squared law. So this is the derivation of the 1 over r squared law. Uh, now this is the way that Newton did it, and I'm not going to go into all of the details. It would be, I mean, that's like a lecture series right there. And at some point in the future I will do such a lecture series, but it's not part of this course. It's just too much detail. It's, each little step is not so bad. It's fairly straightforward, and you guys would be able to follow it. It's basically just geometry, um, but there are a lot of steps. It's just a really large number of steps, and so it would take several lectures just to get through the details of it. But it's very similar steps to what we've looked at when we talked about like, uh, Theorem 1. When we went into more detail on that, we basically demonstrated Theorem 1 of Newton. Um, so that's a, essentially it's the centripetal acceleration, the derivation of that, so it's a circular orbit. Um, but yeah, we're just not going to be able to to do it in a short amount of time. So we're going to do it with a lot of hand waving and I'll cut short all the detailed steps and just show you what ends up happening. So to start with, this is, we'll start with theorem three. We've already talked about theorem one and theorem two um, in the past couple of lectures, I think lectures 69 and 70. So this is his theorem three and this is the theorem that he uses uh, to solve Kepler's problem, right? That orbits are described by ellipses, okay? And he comes to the conclusion that the centripetal force required to make those elliptical orbits is a base of 1 over r squared law, where r is the distance from the, say, the planet to the sun, right? If we're talking about a sun and planet Earth, maybe. Um, so what I've drawn here is just a general elliptical orbit. It's a terrible ellipse, I realize, but just imagine that it's a really great ellipse. Um, for sun is the... the S is the sun, and that's placed at one of the foci of the one of the foci of the ellipse. Um, you can go back to I think it was lecture 67 where it went into some detail on the mathematics of ellipses. Um, and in there we talked about various things. You know, the general form for an ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals one, where a and b are the semi-major and semi-minor axes. Um, the lattice rectum turns out to be important in this theorem 3. Well, actually, it turns out to be important in problem 3, where he applies theorem 3 to Kepler's problem of an elliptical orbit with the center of force at one of the foci, okay? But we're going to talk in general for a moment. So theorem 3, what does it say? Basically, it lays out a system like this. I've labeled some points. C is for the center of the ellipse. S is the focus where the, we imagine the sun to be. S prime is just the other focus, okay? We're not going to use it. Uh, and the distance from here to here, it, it's like the equivalent of a diameter, in a sense, uh, for an ellipse. And that's the lattice rectum. It is related to the ratio, well, it's like proportional to the ratio, or actually equal, not proportional, but equal to the ratio of the semi-major to semi-minor axis. Okay, so it's a parameter which describes the ellipse. You could, you know, we talked before about the eccentricity of an ellipse. It describes how, you know, eccentric it is, how stretched out it is. The lattice rectum would also... Uh, be a good metric, a way to describe the ellipticity uh, of an ellipse. So a lattice rectum of one, for example, would be a circle. Um, I think that, that sounds right. So that is the layout. Now let's see, how does he approach this solving the, the Kepler problem? But first he sets up this theorem three. And so what, what he does is he says, okay, let's recall from theorem one, right, that if I look at this, I'm just going to draw a piece of this. Here is the P. Here's the Q, and here I drop down a, a perpendicular, so that's going to be the point T, right? And so the area of this triangle, S, P, Q, is just equal to, i got to put the S here, S, P times Q, T. And in theorem 1, he showed that this is proportional to the time. Okay, and that if you want to touch, get more details on that, you can go back to, I think it's lecture 69, but maybe it's 68. Um, it's also, it's Newton's second law, right? It's the equal areas and equal times law. So you can cite Kepler on that if you'd like. So that's going to be a result. The, the area of this triangle, SPQ, is going to be equal to or proportional to the time. Okay? Okay. Um, and that is true for any orbital path, okay? Not just this one. Now I want to talk about this QR. So what he does is he imagines, and I've explained this a couple times before, but let me just do it again. That if we imagine that our planet is traveling along, 
let's not uh, let's assume there are no forces right now. It's just traveling along in a straight line. So this path P R would be the tangential or the rectilineal path that it would take, right? Following Newton's first law or you know Galileo's inertia law, it's just going to continue traveling in a straight line because there are no forces acting on it. So what Newton imagines imagines is that every once in a while, right? Like say at this point P, that an impulse is exerted on the the planet. And that changes its velocity, and so it changes the direction that it goes towards Q. Right? That's what this line PQ I've drawn here would be. Right? So it changes that velocity. And so that impulse only occurs you know, at, a, at a finite moment, you know, a single moment right here when it's at P. And then it will continue traveling on in a straight line until it gets to Q. And what he wants to do then is he wants to imagine that R and P get closer and closer together, or Q and P get closer and closer together. Right? So this, if you're familiar with calculus, this is the whole idea about taking the limit Right, as the delta as delta t is approaching zero, right, where you let the time intervals get smaller between impulses get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach, approach zero, and we'll get a result. Okay. What about this this this, this line R Q? What is that about? We'll call that the uh, the deviation. Right, that's the deviation from the tangential path to the true curved path. Okay. And so so if I wrote Q R question mark. Right? This is, we're going to call it the deviation, deviation. So this is the distance, right, over which you would travel to accommodate for what the centripetal acceleration had done. So bring you back onto the path that you'd be on point Q because of the centripetal acceleration. Okay? Okay. So you can think of it like, uh, it's a silly way to think of it, but you imagine you're going and then you, you fall, right? And Newton imagined that if these intervals were small enough, right, when these impulses were applied, that you could imagine that the force was a constant force. So you'd have a constant acceleration. So if the interval that we're talking about over which the impulse is applied is short enough, we can treat it as if the force is just constant during that time. Okay? Okay. So why is that useful? Well, because remember that Galileo had told us that you know the distance traveled is equal to one half times a constant acceleration times t squared. Right? Yeah. This was his inclined plane experiments. And so Newton knew this, of course. And so this is what he's thinking of, right? So what we can then write is that this deviation, QR, is proportional to A0 times T squared, where A0 is just this constant acceleration that we're assuming, OK? Or another way to write this is that A0 is proportional to QR over T squared. All I've done is just algebraically manipulate that, right? Yeah. But wait a minute. T. We have a result for T, right? We know that T is proportional to SP times QT, right? That's what we said before from theorem 1 or from Kepler's second law. So I can rewrite this as QR over QT squared times SP squared. I really should have centered that a little bit. Let me center that. I hate it when these things are not centered. QR over this. Yes? Yeah. So all I've done is I've replaced T squared and taken T from Kepler's second law or Newton's theorem 1 and plugged that in here. Yes? Yeah. And so the whole point of theorem 3 is it says, okay, when we're approaching a force problem, we're trying to figure out how the force works. It causes a certain orbit. This is what we need to to focus on, okay? And in particular, just to get ahead of ourselves, QR over QT squared times 1 over SP squared. This is QR over QT squared is what we'll have to hunt down and see how the geometry changes that. SP, that's just the distance from the force center to the planet, okay? So that's the distance of, say, the Earth from the Sun. You understand? Yeah. So we would try to, we want to get QR over QT squared in terms of that distance or something else. Okay? Okay. And now I know that traditionally when people approach this subject and they talk about deriving, you know, elliptical orbits from Newton's universal gravitation law, they, they tend to like use conservation of energy and uh, they end up they, they use the universal gravitation law and they plug it into conservation of energy, and they finagle the equations until in the end they get an ellipse. And that's cute. It's a great homework exercise for, say, an undergraduate in a college physics course. Um, 
but it's not at all how Newton did it, of course. And it's, in fact, it's exactly backwards of how one would approach it if they were a scientist that was trying to figure these things out. Newton, of course, was going, working with the empirical data he had, which were Newton's, or Kepler's laws, right? Yeah. And trying to figure out what those laws had to say about reality, and physical reality, and uh, with, and, and that, that's, what, that's what he did here, right? Yeah. So he did it in terms of geometry for a couple of reasons. The main reason, I think, is probably because that's what people were familiar with at the time, and if you throw, you know, this is the problem that string theorists have, I think. They throw things together in new packaging, and new crazy mathematics, right? Steve Wolfram is really bad about this and packages it up and then throws it out in terms of that. And people are not going to follow it because you're using mathematics that were invented specifically for your problem. You should show it in what people know. And then people will come and adopt your mathematics like they did Newton's, right, the calculus. So he didn't like use the calculus the way we see it today. Uh, yeah, he, he wrote everything up in terms of the old way of doing things geometrically. And, so, and there's some advantage to that. But anyways, that's a getting aside. Um, all right, so. Let me try to put a summary here. We want, and then of course if I multiply this times mass, then we have a force. So the force is, the centripetal force is proportional to this acceleration, right? So we can say that the centripetal force is proportional to QR over QT squared times 1 over SP squared. All right. So. Newton didn't just solve the Kepler situation. He actually went and did a bunch of hypothetical situations. And so problem one that he considered was, let me draw this. So it's a circular orbit with center of force on circumference. Okay, and so here's a, a, probably too small a picture to see it, but we're not going to go, in all the, go through all the details. But, so he wanted, for problem one, he considered a circular orbit with the center of force on the circumference. Right? So if that was the empirical result that we had, if somebody had made astronomical observations and said, look, I see that the, this, is, this is what we get. Okay? Um, if he said that, the, well, okay, yeah, if they said, if, if Kepler's first law was, Instead of being ellipses with the force center at one of the foci, if instead it was orbits are circle, circular with their force centers on the circumference of the circle, right? That's what he's analyzing here. And it turns out to be the easiest problem to solve geometrically. I'm not, I'm not going to solve it. But so what he, what he ends up finding out in this case, where SA, by the way, is the diameter of the circle, right? This point A here. So he finds that QR over QT squared. is proportional to S A squared over S P cubed. S A squared over S P cubed. Okay? So S A squared, that's fixed. That's 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 a, a metric about the circle. Okay? So for whatever particular circle that you're talking about, that's going to be fixed. Okay? But now we have S P cubed in there. So we can write that the centripetal force, if this was the case, would be proportional to um, 1 over r to the fifth. Why r to the fifth? Because r is just the distance sp, okay? So I'm going to write it as r now, right? So we already have a 1 over r squared here, right? If qr over qt squared is this sa squared over sp cubed, sp cubed times sp squared is sp to the fifth, r to the fifth. We don't worry about the sa squared because that's a constant that doesn't depend on the distance of separation. It has more to do with the circle, okay? okay. As it is the diameter of the circle. So if that was the case, then the force, the centripetal force, would be a 1 over r to the fifth term. It would depend on the distance from the sun, which is somewhere on the circumference, uh, and, and it would vary as 1 over r to the fifth power. Now, what happens when it orbits around and gets to that point? I guess it collides and explodes. I don't know. But that's not the point. This is unphysical. It was just as a way to test out this theorem 3 and see if you can figure out what the force is going to do. Okay? For these situations. Problem two that he solved, it's a little closer to what he wants in the end, and that is elliptical orbit, elliptical, elliptical orbit with center of force, I should start abbreviating this, at center of ellipse. I guess I could draw 
right, good. So we have a center of the ellipse here, and we'll put our, our sun, right, or our center of force, S, at the center of the ellipse. I'll still mark the foci as being these two points here. Um, and I'm just going to put in the point P. I'm not going to draw in the deviation or any of that stuff. And so in this case, he found that QR over QT squared was proportional to, well, let's just say a bunch of stuff, which I'll write in as K, uh, times SP, such that the centripetal force in this case would end up being 1 over R. So that would be a 1 over R relationship. You can think of this kind of similar, right, to just centripetal acceleration, V squared over R, right? Yeah. But uh, there are a lot of extra parameters that went in. I'm not going to draw them all because it would take a lot of space and it's not worth it. But anyways, problem two for this case would be force center is at the center of the ellipse. You would find the force law was 1 over R. Okay? And finally, problem three. Elliptical. Ellip I can't spell this right. Elliptical orbit with center of force at one foci, one focus. Okay? That's the Kepler. This is, you know, the Kepler. A.K.A. Kepler. First law. Okay? So in that case, he finds that Q.R. over Q.T. squared is proportional to 1 over the lattice rectum. This quantity over here. The lattice rectum, though, is characteristic of the elliptical orbit itself. Okay? It's not dependent on the distance of the planet from the, uh, the source of gravity, right? So the force center, the term I've been using. And so it's, it's really just a characteristic of the ellipse. Remember, the lattice rectum itself is the ratio, I believe it's the semi major axis to the semi minor axis. So if it was x squared over a plus y squared over b equals 1, it would be a over b, essentially, right? And so what does that do? That means that the centripetal force is proportional to 1 over r squared. And he concluded, he said, therefore, since the empirical evidence indicates that this is true, the orbits are elliptical with their center of force at one of the foci, focus, one of the foci at one focus, right? Um, that the force is obeying a 1 over r squared law, or an inverse square law is what it's usually called. And so this was his big universal gravitation result, that the force responsible for the orbits obeys an inverse square law. Yes? Does that make sense? Now, do I have any more to say about this? I don't think so. No. So, this is problem three is the lengthiest and most difficult of his problems. Problem one is not that. I could probably do that in 20 minutes, 15 minutes up here. Very easy. You know, I think we need one geometrical proof from Euclid that I might have to explain or talk about briefly. But uh, I actually think we've used it before. So this, you would use the same Proposition 36 that we talked about in the last lecture, I believe. So we already got that done, so maybe I can do this in 10 minutes. But it's not a physical situation, but it's a good demonstration of how to use his method, right? Use Theorem 3, figure out what QR over QT squared is. Find its dependence on, on the distance of the force center from the planet. We'll call it a planet, projectile, whatever. Um, Problem two, I really haven't looked at problem two in much detail before, but problem three is a lot, there's a lot of steps. And so that would probably be a few lectures all in of itself just to get through that. Okay? Okay. But this is the result. So next time, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do, but we'll, we'll work on this. We'll talk about, okay, it's proportional to 1 over r squared. Let's figure out what it's equal to. So maybe we'll talk about Cavendish's experiment with measuring the gravitational constant to figure out the proportionality constant, uh, integrated with Newton's second law, and, and all that. Okay? So it'll be more traditional physics and less this old school geometry stuff. But uh, yeah, so this was his crowning achievement and it was a real you know, master stroke. So that's it. <laughs>